March 15th, 2024. Election Day in Russia. The presidential candidates, Vladimir Putin, and a few others that no one outside of Russia has ever heard of. And for that matter, many within Russia have never heard of either. After three days of voting, the polls came to a close, and it was clear that Vladimir Putin had won easily, thereby securing an unprecedented fifth term in office. Or at least I think he did. I am recording this before the first votes were cast. But that is the whole point of this video. Russia does not have competitive federal elections. The country is not unique in that regard, both in the structure and the competitiveness. Elections and autocracies are commonplace. During the Cold War, it was about 40% of them. After the Soviet Union crumbled, it had grown to a nice 69%. For Western observers, the whole process is baffling. Why bother going through the whole song and dance when everyone already knows who is going to win? But the reality is more complicated. Elections sometimes represent the greatest threat to an autocrat's tenure. By contrast, when an elected leader loses office within a well-established democracy, they tend to just go home. But for autocrats, on average, it is a very different story. Indeed, when an autocrat loses office, that might not be the only thing that he loses. So today, we will cover some of the reasons, many bizarre and others not so bizarre, that autocracies run elections. Beginning with democratic legacies, then moving to Western diplomatic pressure, and attempts to maintain domestic legitimacy. Collectively, you might think of these as the because-they-have-to categories. However, there are also a variety of reasons that autocrats can directly benefit from elections, including gathering accurate information regarding citizen preferences, deflecting the blame for certain policy failures, resolving competency and corruption problems with local officials, helping make credible commitments to regime cronies, and finally giving a more efficient alternative to coup plotters. But we begin with democratic legacies. This is fitting because it is the origin of the Russian electoral situation. It may seem hard to believe, but there was a brief period of time when it appeared that Russia was transitioning to a democracy, and flawed as it was during the early post-Soviet years, Russia further regressed to an illiberal democracy by the mid-2000s, a process that accelerated after Putin replaced Yeltsin. Officially, the Russian constitution dictated that the country had democratic institutions. But in practice, enough went on behind the scenes that the government in power did not have to face competition in free and fair elections. However, that does not mean that the leadership is completely off the hook. There are limits to what media control can do. If you mismanage the economy too much, or go a bit too far with your adventurous foreign policies, you may very well find yourself in a situation where the voters turn against you, and bureaucrats refuse to tweak the numbers so that you win anyway, or the citizens outright reject what the official numbers say. Although Putin still appears to have enough popularity right now that none of this is on the horizon, popular protests still represent a big problem with autocratic elections more generally. There is safety in numbers when protesters march on the streets. Remember that the traditional advantage that autocratic regimes have is control over the media, which otherwise could help people coordinate on when and where to protest. Elections are high-profile events that invite spontaneous protesting, and that hints at why elections stick around in autocracies. They are artifacts of a more democratic past. Ah, the glory days, when Spaniels were in the White House. The thing is, canceling elections also serves as a coordination mechanism, just like an actual election would, except cancellations appear blatantly unfair, whereas managed elections at least have the aura of authenticity. Thus, canceling an election often creates a bigger problem than it solves, and in turn, the elections persist. Next up is Western diplomatic pressure. In contrast to the prior explanation, here we have a reason why autocratic governments start elections. One of the big differences between the Cold War and the post-Cold War era is how smaller states secure foreign aid. 
During the Cold War, you could approach one of the superpowers. If the first one said no, then you would just go to the other. Thus, neither side cared much about what was going on with the country's domestic politics. It was the international allegiance that mattered. That all changed when the Soviet Union fell apart, and the superpower competition disappeared. Previously, the United States and the West were more willing to overlook questionable regimes. Afterward, it became common to make economic aid contingent on holding democratic elections. Now, in practice, those democratic elections can turn into democratic elections, or democratic elections. But this is a classic situation where advocates of democracy do not let perfect be the enemy of good, or at least an improvement over the alternative. In Russia's high-profile federal election, few doubt that the official numbers will be anything other than positive for the incumbent. But that is not universally the case. For example, in 2000, Vicente Fox won Mexico's presidential election, and thereby ended 71 years of pre-rule in the country. Meanwhile, the Gambia provides an example from a less institutionalized setting. Flashback to 2016. Yahya Jame, seen here in a 2014 White House gathering of African leaders, had been in power 20 years but just lost the presidential election. After briefly signaling his intention to not give up power, the economic community of West African states threatened to militarily intervene. And indeed, once Senegal began marching toward the capital, Jame went into exile. So, yes, it took a little bit of military intervention, but none of that would have been possible without the mandate of an electoral loss. That is why the West is willing to put up with elections, just as long as the quotes don't get too big. And with that caveat, that aid might go down as the size goes up. Because elections still provide an accountability mechanism, even if it is weak, some portion of this number is due to the Benjamins. The final forced reason for autocratic elections is domestic legitimacy. By this theory, the Cold War was a battle of competing ideologies, democracy versus communism. Democracy won out, leaving it difficult for autocrats, communist or not, to claim that their system of government is good for the people. And thus we get elections. How effective the ruse of elections is depends on the awareness of the country's citizens. Someone living in Iraq with even the slightest international exposure might have been just a bit dubious when, in 2002, Saddam Hussein received 100% support in a referendum that also had 100% turnout. And yes, these numbers actually did happen. Uh, I mean, happened. Press X to doubt. Even more remarkable was the fact that not a single ballot was declared invalid. Take that, Florida. But the better that the government monopolizes the media airwaves, the more that faults with the electoral system can be swept under the rug. This normative basis for elections is not universal, though. The Chinese Communist Party, in particular, tries to derive its legitimacy from good governance, and likes pointing out all of the faults with Western elections, specifically that they create divisions that disrupt a country's harmony. Thus, we continue on to the ways that autocracies directly benefit from elections, beginning with information gathering. Take any given autocrat. The game he is playing against his country's citizens is figuring out how to provide just enough goods and services to convince the masses that rebellion is not in their best interests. The problem is that autocrats may not know exactly where the citizens' red line is drawn. Yep. Lines aren't just for maps. Worse for him, using the state's security forces and bureaucracy to try to establish an answer might not work as well as one would like. We have talked before in a different context about how there are strong incentives to tell an autocrat that everything is fine, even if it is not. And that creates a perverse incentive for officials to not even bother figuring out the truth given that they intend to not be the bearer of bad news regardless. In contrast, elections can act as a more objective poll of the population. Ignore what the official numbers say. 
the state still has access to the raw data, and that helps give the leader some guidance about whether the existing policies are working, or if the state needs to make changes to avoid a rebellion. Take Venezuela's December 2023 referendum as an example. Remember when the Esequibo crisis was the only thing anyone wanted to talk about for a hot minute? If you do not, this is when Nicolas Maduro appeared to be interested in fanning the flames regarding a disputed region between Venezuela and Guyana, either for the oil or for his own domestic political benefit. But the wisdom of such a move depended on how much the average Venezuelan cared about the issue. Enter the referendum where the official results showed an absurdly high 98% of voters supported challenging Guyana over the territory. Was that the real number? Who knows? That is actually beside the point. As long as Maduro has the true number, he has a better idea about whether he should continue the crisis or let it go. Next up is deflecting blame. The idea here is that you build a dual-track political system, a primary one with centralized power, not subject to electoral pressures, and a subservient one that has some level of political independence, but whose membership is closely overseen by the primary power. This allows the primary power to explore various policy reforms without having to accept responsibility for the failures. If you want to try something new, you simply permit a controllable reformer to win the election. The controllable reformer then implements the policy. If it works out, then great. If it fails, no big deal. You are not responsible. The people voted for it. So you simply push the reformer out and start anew. As that last image hinted at, Iran is a good example of a system that appears to implement this strategy. In 2013, a reformer named Hassan Rouhani ran for president. The Guardian Council, a control mechanism for the Ayatollah, accepted his bid despite Rouhani's platform calling for improved relations with the West. This led to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, aka the Iran Deal, to be signed in July of 2015. Outwardly, none of this was the Ayatollah's idea. As such, if and when the deal came apart, it was the fault of the presidential administration, not the higher political powers. As such, if anyone was to protest, they can direct their energy at the scapegoat. Next up is to resolve competency and corruption problems with local officials. China is a one-party system, but still uses quasi-competitive elections at the local level. Now, candidates are required to be members of the CCP and have to be approved before making it to the ballot, but once there, it is up to the voters to decide. Part of the reason for this is because it outsources government oversight to the average citizen. After all, the central government has a vested interest in having competent officials at the village level. They are not major threats to the broader political authority, and policy failures at the local level will just create undue frustration. The same goes if those low-level officials are more interested in accruing ill-gotten gains than governing. The problem for the CCP is that, in a country with a population of 1.4 billion, auditing every local leader would be absurdly expensive. Thus, the government essentially outsources the oversight to the voters. If someone is known to be incompetent or corrupt, voters can simply choose the other candidate. The process saves the central government a ton of money, and it also comes with the nice bonus of deflecting any of the blame for poor local governance to the voters, who are responsible for choosing the particular leader. It is a win-win for the party leaders. Next, we pivot to inside the regime, and look at making credible commitments to regime cronies. Broadly, Autocratic regimes face two binding constraints, revolution by the masses, and coups from within. Even in autocracies, where power is seemingly centralized in the hands of a single individual, autocrats still need the support of at least a handful of key players to maintain their grip on power. However, 
Cronies must worry that their favor with a leader may come to an end, and with it will come the loss of their income streams, jail, or worse. As such, if circumstances give a crony a short-term opportunity to initiate a coup with a high chance of success, the leader might not be able to deter the challenge. That is because the autocrat would need to promise long-term benefits to the coup plotter. But once the ability to conduct a coup passes, the autocrat can renege on the concessions and replace the crony with someone less ambitious. Oops, bad example. But you get the idea here. In less extreme cases, elections can help smooth out the commitment problem. If the autocrat fails to hand out the concessions promised to the crony, but simultaneously is constrained from outright eliminating him, then the crony can threaten to run against the autocrat in the election. To deter that, the autocrat must continue to provide concessions. In turn, we see a decline in the crony's need to exploit short-term windows of opportunity to initiate a coup. Thus, creating a vulnerability ironically stabilizes the autocrat's power. Finally, and piggybacking off the previous idea, is to institutionalize voting when an autocrat faces the threat to the regime. Coups are inefficient processes. In a bad situation, they may cause widespread civil unrest and economic disruption. And in a worst-case scenario, they might lead to a full-scale civil war. Consequently, if challenges are going to occur to your regime, it would be nice if they happened in a more orderly and more efficient manner. Elections can serve that purpose. Rather than facing a coup threat at all times, instead you have a dedicated time period determined by the election's calendar. And yes, there may be economic upheaval following an election as well, but the hope is that it will be less than the alternative. Meanwhile, even if elections empower the opposition, the trade-off might be worthwhile to the autocrat. Better to have a wealthier country that you are slightly less likely to maintain control over than a dirt-poor country where your control is more stable. And that's elections and autocracies for you. You know, it's rare we get to cover a topic with evergreen relevance. Why not check out this playlist about other political problems with perennial importance? And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.